Hi everyone, this is Tara Miller with the Quilt District and I am excited to welcome you to episode three with the six know-it-alls and their six quilts. Please stick around after the discussion and a brief intermission for live Q&A with the ladies. Thanks so much and enjoy the show. friends welcome you're at episode three of six quilts six know-it-alls and here are your six know-it-alls on your screen um from left to right mary k waldvogel at the top julie silver i'm talking uh barbara brackman in the middle on the left debbie cooney on the right lynn bassett on the left bottom and Alden O'Brien on the right bottom. We, uh, for those of you who don't know what this is about, the six of us have been meeting for um, almost a year now, since near the start of the pandemic, every Monday, and we are we have just gotten together and um, talked and uh, consoled one another and um, had a lot of fun. We talked personal stuff and um, political stuff, but we also talked quilts because guess what? We all love quilts. And what we found was that over time, we were talking about quilts more and more. And somebody would bring a quilt that they didn't understand or had a question about or a new discovery. And a few months ago, we thought to ourselves, why not share this with the public? So that's what we're doing. We're gonna see episode three today, and each of us is gonna present a quilt, and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. And Barbara Brackman is gonna start. Barbara Brackman is a quilt historian and author from Lawrence, Kansas. Barbara's written many books over the past 40 years, indexing patterns, exploring women's history through their quilt making, and giving guidelines for dating fabrics and quilts. Barbara writes several blogs about quilt history, including material culture and Civil War quilts. Barbara, you're on. I'm on. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Um, we're going to talk about a Lindsay quilt. And this is a quilt that I found at a flea market. And this is what I saw. I took a snapshot of it as I went through the flea market. And I thought, oh, that's pretty homely. But it could be Lindsay. So I ran up there and looked at it closely. And sure enough, it was. Now. We're going to talk about Lindsay. Mary Kay's the expert on Lindsay, but some of the people who are in costumes would know a lot about it too. And what attracted me right away was this kind of fabric that's a check that looks like a mixed uh, mixed yarn, where the navy blue is probably the wool, and then the white is probably a cotton. And so that that's called Lindsay Woolsey, even though most people think that might be linen. It is not, it's cotton. And there are many different uh, heavy fabrics in here. I think this red is a wool, might be a Lindsay too, but it's the one that's bleeding. You saw back here how it's uh, <clears throat> staining the rest of the quilt, which is too bad. But here's a great piece of Lindsay. And it, uh, they often use a very basic dyes, uh, indigo blue, and a matter red and then the cotton was undyed because it doesn't take dye as well as the wool mm -hmm. so um there's some white but i think that in this case some of the white has been dyed by the staining of that that bleeding red and i think looking at it fairly closely i, I think that most of these are all wools but my favorites of course are the ones that pattern and the wind 
a very common thing to see in Lindsay quilts is these checks. And it's just amazing how, um, how much variety they could get with very limited pattern and very limited dyes. And here's a good one too, a stripe, which is a stripe, well, I'm going too far, a stripe, which is a, a different kind of a pattern. So one reason I wanted to show this was I've been working on the Alcotts, Louisa May and her family here. And I found, I was reading Abigail Alcott's diary. This is Marmy or Mommy, as they probably would have pronounced it in New England. And Marmy, after the Civil War, Louisa by that time was, uh, was right living in both Boston and back home with her family in Concord. And when she'd come to visit, Marmy would put her to work. And it says, Louisa busying herself here, making me a Lindsay Woolsey dress. And then she explains it to us. Uh, a kind of fabric when I was young and it's cotton and wool. And I was so pleased that she explained it. The, uh, Abigail, Abba was her nickname, was born in 1800. So we're talking about uh, dresses that she recalled from the early 19th century. But then again, here's Louisa making her a, a Lindsay Woolsey dress after the Civil War. So there's a lot of um, myths about Lindsay Woolsey, a lot of misconceptions, and a lot because because it's named Lindsay Woolsey, many people think it's made of linen and wool. But for the most part, I think in the United States, uh, what we see is cotton and wool combination. And I have a few just a few things here that uh, relate. This is a beautiful Lindsay petticoat from the Brooklyn Museum. And uh, I think then might have been a little bit scratchy myself, but then again, I'm a wuss. So um, what you often see is people thinking of this as homespun, homemade, homespun wools woven at home on looms. And um, this is often the case. What the first ad I have here in the middle is from 1852 before the Civil War. And somebody wants to buy good plaid homemade Lindsay in bright colors. And I think that this petticoat would qualify there. Um, so what you often see is that people would spin the wool at home, buy the cotton, the, because it's harder to spin cotton, and then weave this and then trade it, use it as barter at stores and also sell it to, uh, to wholesalers who would then resell it to stores. So there's quite a bit of information about Lindsay being a home spun yarn, the elusive home spun. So many times people look at cotton and say, this is 100% cotton, this is home spun, but that's not, that's not really what we are seeing when people talk about home spun. But Lindsay certainly is one of them. And then I have a little later, a little later at 1888. And this is a, a South Carolina, I think so, North Carolina mill. And if you bring in your wool, they will make you Lindsay. And what we see a lot of is factory made Lindsay too. So the, the knee jerk reaction that's saying this is homespun is, is probably not accurate. It's both homespun and factory made. And it was certainly, um, certainly the mainstay of a lot of warm clothing, both North and South. Here we have South Carolina or North Carolina, and then we have Abigail Alcott in Massachusetts. So what do you guys, what do you guys think? I'm gonna stop my share. Oh, I got a lot to say. <laughs> Hand it over to Lynn Z. Oh. Lindsay Bassett. Yeah, Lindsay Woolsey That's is right. Right. Um, uh, A couple of things. First, you know, um, the, the Lindsay Woolsey really was linen and wool until the Industrial Revolution made cotton so, so much more common. Um, and and uh, so it's really the 19th century that you see all the, all the cotton used in it. Um, uh, the and it's it's been a life's goal of mine to get people to stop calling the whole cloth wool quilts Lindsay Woolsey's. What should we call them? Whole cloth wool quilt. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's no linen. It's, it's a little bit more of a mouthful. 
I can do that. But but you can see from those pieces that you show that they have nothing to do with those elegant Kalamanco, you know, the 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 glazed uh, calendared worsteds that are imported and and relatively expensive. They have nothing to do with Lindsay Woolsey, except that you you find Lindsay Woolsey used and and the cotton wool used on the back in the later ones. I should modify my statement to say that the cotton and wool is 19th century rather than American. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's I would suggest. Say that again, the, Barbara. The cotton and wool combination is 19th century rather than just American. But that's because, Lynn, I know so little about the 18th century. You're my go-to person. Now remind me, is it cotton and linen? Be, I'm, um, I'm sorry, wool and either cotton or linen. Um, one is always the warp and one is always the weft because one is stronger than the other. I, I can never remember this. Can you help me out with that, Lynn? The the cotton or linen is the warp, right? Wool because it's stronger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have one one more um, comment that we need to be careful about. Um, the definition of homespun because homespun doesn't necessarily mean made in the home. Manufacturers used it also to differentiate fabrics produced here versus fabrics that were produced um, oh, you know, overseas or whatever. Oh, yeah. French oh. production. For instance, you'll, you'll see um, George Washington's uh, inaugural coat described in the period literature as being made of homespun, but it was made in Hartford at the wool at the Hartford Wool and Manufacturing Company. Yeah, it wasn't made in the home. Martha did not spin the home. She no. did not. So yeah. home would, home would refer to the U.S. Probably is that domestic? That yeah, yeah. It, it, it can yeah. be. You know, either domestic in the home yeah. or domestic in the United States. It's just um, you you can't assume that when you see the term homespun that they mean in the home. Yeah, when I was doing research for my agreeable tyrant exhibit, you know, you kept seeing homespun, homespun, or a lot of talk about domestic manufacturers, and they weren't necessarily saying um, we want all the women to sit around and do nothing but spin. Although there were a few old crotchety, you know, misogynists who wanted you to sit around and spin, so you didn't have any time to do something really indulge, self indulgent like read novels. <gasps> but um, <laughs> By and large, they really were just trying to encourage an American uh, textile industry. Um, and so when they were saying domestic manufacture um, and homespun interchangeably, that's what they were often talking about. I have a question. Um, the, the white fabric that people, the, the kind of uh, loosely woven white fabric that people often call homespun was, did anybody actually home spin <laughs> cotton and cotton white and white mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah if yeah. you look at the excuse me if, if you look at the the diary of um the, the midwife in hallowell maine whose name is escaping me Mar all martha days. ballard thank you martha ballard she talks about buying raw cotton to take home and spin it um you could spin cotton on on a walking wheel which is otherwise used for wool. So yeah, they were definitely spinning cotton at home and buy, buying it raw and spinning it at home. But it was hard to do. And when the mills came in, at least in the South, early 1800s, you took your cotton to your local mill, just like you would take your corn to your flour mill, but you take mm -hmm. your raw cotton to your mill and they would spin it for you. And then you come home um, they come back and they give you these hanks of yarn, cotton mm -hmm. yarn, and then you put it on your loom and and put your wool across. That's that was really common in mm -hmm. well, we've all been doing this for a long time and I you know I can't count the thousands and thousands and thousands of times that somebody looks at the back of a quilt that's white and because it's kind of nubby or uh you know loose weave, they call it homespun and it's it's as I'm understanding it, it almost never is the white and white. 
Mm, well, we can't yeah, really yeah. tell. And, you know, the I mean, might be. the weaving might be, yeah. it might be cotton and cotton. Yes. But that would be, I think within. that would be minor, you know, a minor percentage of the batch that we see. Right. Uh, and I think it was called domestic cloth. It was inexpensive and uh, it's coarse, but it's what you put on the back. Well, I've even been told that on the back of a double wedding ring, that comes from. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. So is there a time, no, is there a time when we would um, start seeing a whole lot less of it, any specific? After the Civil War, I think. Well, yeah. and at, at that point, we do have a textile industry. So at some point, we're going to stop making a fuss about saying this is domestic manufacture slash homespun. Um, and in the Civil War, of course, then you get a, a, a lot of Southerners do kind of reviving the American Revolution period of saying, we're going to be independent, we're going to get women spinning their own things so we don't buy any, you know, th we don't have to buy anything from those northern factories. And so there becomes this very politicized thing to make homespun dresses, of which there are a few extant, um, but, you know, it all becomes politicized over again. But um, the word homespun just stops meaning anything after, I don't know, 1830s, 1840s, as we start having a real textile industry to talk about, we don't have to make a big fuss about it being homespun or, or anything. And, and we don't, and homespun also is associated with that coarseness and that sort of lack of refinement. Right. And that's not what we want to advertise. We want to say these are just as refined and beautiful and sophisticated and, and well made as anything you could be importing. So homespun is not an adjective I would think they would want to use. Well, we could talk about this forever. Well, okay. yes, it I lasts, <laughs> one more thing. It lasts um, in deep um, Pennsylvania German communities. It lasts after the civil war because they just went on doing what they had been doing for all this time. And there've been a couple of AQSG papers on how it continues in Louisiana. Interesting. After yeah, even into the sure, 20th sure. century, but Real that's very cool. rare. Well, what well, happened after the Civil War too was that the South started their own textile industry, and so it became more, it became cheaper and more practical to just buy local, local, domestically factory produced stuff, and uh, and do other things with your time. All right, excellent. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, Lynn, you're up. It's Lynn uh, Bassett who's an independent scholar specializing in historic costume and textiles. Among Lynn's many projects are award-winning exhibitions and catalogs, including Home, Front, and Battlefield, Quilts and Context in the Civil War, co-authored with Madeline Shaw. Lynn was also prior author and editor of Massachusetts Quilts, Our Common Wealth, um, <laughs> and um, Lynn, why don't you begin? Okay. Uh, well, as I have mentioned in uh, previous Six Quilt, Six Know-It-Alls, I'm the guest curator of an exhibition at the Florence Griswold Museum in Lyme, Connecticut that will open um, in February of 2022. And so I, I have um, these quilts that I'm working on as part of that exhibition. This all started, uh, my, my interest in these quilts started years ago when I happened to be at the Florence Griswold Museum and they had on display this quilt and it, and it just, it's so distinctive with that polka dot background that it just, um, it stayed in my memory for, for years afterwards. And then I was working at the Connecticut Historical Society and look, another one of these polka dot quilts came in. And I was like, wow, that one's just like the one at the Florence Griswold Museum. And then, oh, and here, here's some more details of the one from the Flo Grizz. So you can see how beautifully uh, stuffed these motifs are. And then my friend Alden wrote to me <laughs> about, oh, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. And she said, you know, I was poking around on the CHS 
collections, uh, online collections, and I see that CHS has a quilt that's like one here at the DAR. And so that's three of these polka dot quilts. Hmm. And so I ask Alden to kindly um, draw on mylar the motifs of her quilt so I could lay it on top of the other quilts. Mm -hmm. And so here you see this is actually, um, I hope you can see there, there's the outlines of, of Alden's drawing laid on top of the uh, Flo Grizz quilt. Mm -hmm. And it's basically the same. Uh, I think it's not exactly the same because the DAR quilt is not stuffed as hard as the one at the flow grizz so it's it's a little it's a little different but it's basically the same and that was the way it was with all of um, the motifs uh, that she traced and that I then uh, applied to the flow grizz okay so while I'm there at the flow grizz they pull out their file and in that file there is an article from the American Folk Art Museum of another quilt so that's four, four of these quilts. And three of them have histories of um, being from the Lyme area. Okay, so then, <laughs> so then Alden throws this marvelous um, symposium at the DAR Museum a year and a half ago. And Hallie Bond, who's working on quilts in the Adirondacks put up a picture of one of these quilts and Alda and I about jumped out of our seats. <laughs> and so that was five, five, I'm losing track here, five. Okay. And then Hallie says, look, there's another one. They have two. So that's six of these quilts. Okay. And so I was like, okay, what is this doing up in Jefferson County, New York. Well, the interesting thing is that they are from Lyme, New York. Lyme, New York was founded by somebody from the Lyme area of Connecticut. Okay, so, um, so Eber Kelsey is probably the source of these two quilts. He was from Killingworth um, and he was a founder of Lyme. And his wife, Lucy Ann Leet Kelsey, is from Saybrook. Okay, so here's this is New London County in Connecticut. This is Long Island Sound. This is the Connecticut River. I'm is here. Saybrook is right here. So she was from the town directly across the river from Lyme. So here, here are these quilts and details of all of them. You can see how extremely similar they are. And the layout is even the same. You know, the motifs are placed in the same places on these quilts. And um, the one that's at the Flow Grizz uh, has a history of having been made by a girl who was 16 years old. So, I'm wondering, A, is that entirely wrong? Was it given it? Was it given to her? Is there a professional quilter who is pumping these things out? Or is there someone who is providing the patterns and other people are, are stitching them? And so um, COVID has really messed up my research on this because I want to get to these other places to count the stitches and compare them and such. Um, but looking just at the Flow Grizz one, the stitching is not even all the way around it. So it does seem like maybe multiple hands worked on quilting it. Um, but three of these quilts have specific, well, fairly specific histories, at least family histories. And, and like I said, they're all from Lyme. And then those two from the Adirondacks come from families that were originally from that area. So there, there does seem to be one person who is, um, who, who is inspiring 
all of these quilts. So what do you think? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I wrote down two things, but you said them. Oh. You know what, I, you know what Barbara's going to suggest? There, I mean, she knows what I'm going to suggest. Go you know, back to the gallery view. Go back. And, oh, oh, no, never mind. What? Sorry. See the people. Uh, Look at the people. Oh. Stop sharing. We have Stop sharing. Sorry. Got it, got it, got it. Mm -hmm. we have okay. Evidence that people marked quilts commercially as a profession. So that was my first thought. And then I, I should say, I don't think I even um, gave the date. These are all like um, the histories are 1820s. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't, wow. you know, you don't see many of these white work cotton quilts before that, because as you were just saying about cotton, it had to take the industrial revolution to make it quite available. So you might see an earlier whole cloth silk quilt or a wool quilt. The other thing I was going to say, what she said, is that someone was pumping these out as <laughs> Yeah, and doubtful that a 16-year-old is pumping well, these. I, you know, I, I've taught many 16-year-olds in my life and get them <laughs> to pay attention. I think the way we can remember these, though, that they're from Lyme is that they seem to have a rash of some kind. But I always, my theory on polka dots is you can't have too many. It's <laughs> very funny because strange background you know this is very much one person's kind of vision well i would love to find out if there are any more out there so yeah. you know you know one of the things that we hope will happen here is if anybody might have seen something like this yeah. or get in touch with us and at the end of our uh, talk here or in our episode here or in the middle we'll have a um a contact sheet for how to get a hold of any of us and also a yeah I Let us know. I want to put in my, uh, my two cents, which is I uh, even beyond the com the person who is paid to go around and trace the patterns and so on. It seems extremely interesting and compelling and important that it's not just the individual motifs that are exactly the same, which you could imagine someone having her template or whatever and and copying those motifs, but the placement of the motifs in relation to one another, including all those background polka dots, is identical. When I sent those mylar tracings of each of the larger motifs, like the sunflower and that, you know, feathery frond and the, and, cornucopia. And whatever, the cornucopia, I also, you know, I made the mylar big enough so you could see where the polka dots were around it and also where the next motif was. And if you look at the overall shots, everything is placed in exactly the same place and you know if barbara got onto it with her ace photoshopping skills and superimposed them in you know you could probably see that they're really 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 close and there's something about it that you know usually even if you gave one to lucy and you gave one to kelsey and you gave one to you know lydia and whoever you're they're all going to put their own spin on it and say, you know what, I like the sunflower better. I'm going to put the sunflowers here instead. These are absolutely cookie cutter. And I really think that argues strongly for a commercial product. Very um, I'm going to just let us know that we need to move on. But, okay. Um, this is great. You. If you've seen one of these people yeah. out there, let, 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 let me know. know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Debbie. We're going in uh, alphabetical order of last names today. Debbie, Debbie Cooney is a quilt historian and collector with a special interest in quilts made in a 200 mile radius of Washington, DC, Maryland, Southern Pennsylvania, and Northern Virginia. Debbie participated in several county specific quilt documentation projects conducted in Pennsylvania. She was an editor of a Maryland album, the book from the state's documentation project and co-author of the 2017 Uncoverings paper, Baltimore Album Quilts, New Research. Debbie. Okay. I found this quilt at a household dispersal sale of a woman recently widowed and moving in with one of her children. I had not seen this applique motif before, but it did not seem out of place in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, a town in Franklin County, just over the Mason-Dixon line from central Maryland. Once I had outbid the competitors, my first question was who made the quilt and when? 
a couple of quilt dealers concurred with me on the date of, um, of mid 19th century and perhaps a little later. The auctioneer helped a great deal by pointing out a family member for me to query. He had no idea of the quilt's history, but agreed to give my phone number to his mother-in-law, Frances Betts, the seller of the house and its contents. I've been to plenty of sales like this where family members don't know much about their backgrounds. So I got to work on finding out as much about Mrs. Betts and her forebears as I could. Her husband, Francis Ferdinand's obituary found online provided a starting point. The couple's parentage went back several generations to early 19th century in the same Pennsylvania, Maryland border area. Almost all of them turned up in burial records with census li listings giving further details. By their dates, it appears that the quilt originated in the couple's great grandparents' generation in the mid 19th century. When I didn't hear anything from Mrs. Betts for a couple of weeks after the sale, I called all four of her children and located her. She was pleased that someone was taking an interest and agreed to look at my rough family tree. The, when she had seen it and she called me back and said the quilt was, uh, had been passed down in her husband's line and she identified the quilt maker as Anna Metzger Bickel. Anne lived from um, 1848 to 1936 in Smithsburg, a small town 10 miles south of Waynesboro. This is Waynesboro where I bought the quilt and here's Smithsburg down there. It's in Washington County, Maryland. Now I would have pegged one of the other great grandmothers, Mary Betts, born in 1827, who lived near Hagerstown, or Sarah Milheims, who was born in 1834, or Sophia Study, born in 1831. Both of these women lived in Adams County, south of Gettysburg, just 25 miles northeast of Smithsburg and off this map by just a little bit. Uh, and Metzger was only 12 in 1860. Mm. We all know that young women did make quilts when they were young. Alden, with her years of genealogical research at the in the DAL with the DAR's quilt collection has encountered family histories that do not match up with the fabrics or style of the purported quilt maker's life dates. So perhaps Anne's mother, Elizabeth Newcomer Metzger, 1823 to 1912, made the quilt, perhaps with Anne's help. Well, having gone as far as I could with the quilt maker's identity, the second question involved the source of the applique motif. The tree shows um, a flare that kind of suggests its designer has an artistic bent or artistic training. And perhaps this pattern was not unique at all, but was passed around in the local community. I went back to the earliest representation of trees on American quilts and coverlets to get some sense of progression from one style to the next. Some of the earliest trees were stitched into white work quilts or embroidered like this early piece possibly from Connecticut from the mid 18th century. Uh, yeah. Or beautifully printed chintzes provided motifs that could be cut out and stitched to a new ground if someone could afford the colorful imported fabrics. And here we have a lush mango tree taken from three repeats of yardage as the center medallion. And uh, tropical trees and game bird chintzes were popular after 1815 and through the 1820s in the US. By the 1830s, chintz applique given way to motifs constructed from calico prints and solids. The early, an early one of these um, was, were not like this one, were not all that well designed as those of the printed chintzes, but they signaled a trend toward individual creativity by American women. These early 1830 trees are rather top heavy, but they're, they're kind of charming. Another source was jacquard woven coverlets found especially in Pennsylvania and Maryland among residents of German descent. Coverlets were preferred bed coverings of Germanic families up through the 1850s. Trees among the, um, of the tree patterns were used by coverlet weavers such as those seen here dated 1834 and 1842. Mm. They look like apple trees, probably reminders of biblical tree of knowledge. 
The boughs on two of the trees flanking uh, the center birds of this small 1836 coverlet bend like those of the calico motif, and the fruits on the central tree are similarly oversized. The border of this 1847 coverlet sports a row of trees topped by bulbous, tempting apples. But Smithburg was only 50 miles northwest of Baltimore, which probably was the source of its fabrics and many of its cultural influences, including the Baltimore album quilts. Applique motifs, which had become, which had been rather simple in the 1820s and 30s, suddenly became wondrously representational and varied in the 1840s around Baltimore, especially. Uh, bows produced in Baltimore were among the most complex and realistic depictions of buildings, monuments, and all kinds of flora and fauna. Here are two examples of apple tree blocks made before 1850. Just this year, a quilt appeared at auction with block very similar to the stylized tree figure on the Smithsburg quilt. I couldn't stop looking um, at this as uh, just as the Mid-Atlantic, however, I had to look for apple trees later than 1860 and in other parts of this fast exam expanding country to learn of its, if the motif had caught on anywhere else. This quilt made in East Tennessee about 1850 ref references the tree in the Garden of Eden, according to the fam a family member who brought it into the state documentation day. Cherry trees, one dated 1852 from Kentucky and another from Pennsylvania around 1860 are more slender and graceful compositions than the apple trees found so far. Many of the quilt maker skills had improved since the 1830s for sure. Several examples of these fruit tree quilts exist, suggesting that a pattern was available by some means uh, in the late 19th century. The birds are almost exactly like those seen on woven coverlets, whose popularity had waned in favor of quilts after the Civil War era. This pattern is found on quilts made quite far apart in Connecticut and Virginia in the late 19th century. By this time, the Ladies Art Company of Chicago had begun to sell patterns everywhere, reachable by mail services. Thus, blocks designs were likely to show up with few, a few variations in many more states and territories. This pattern is very similar to the uh, apple tree of the, Smith, uh, the Smithsburg quilt. Well, a couple of years ago, a quilt dealer called me to say that he had seen several quilts and bought them near Shippensburg, which is in, uh, in the northern part of Franklin County. It's up here. It's about 50 miles north of Smithsburg. What he included was one made of sateen fabrics in the 1920s. It's not wonderful, but it's almost the exact same motif as that on the apple tree from 60 years earlier. So this is likely a, a popular pattern in the region west of the Susquehanna River to central Pennsylvania and down to Maryland counties west of Baltimore. I would love to see others of this design if anybody knows about them. Wow. Fantastic. Cool. So a great motif and a great rundown, Debbie. You were so it. exhaustive in your research. I, I kind of overdid it there. <laughs> no, 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 no such Not thing. I had a quilt with that one of those motifs where the apples are stuffed and can, and also hanging. Oh, it's a 20th century quilt. Mm -hmm. I have photos of it. I'll be happy to share with you. Thank you. Um, but it's uh, I can't remember remember exactly which one it's like, but it's like a couple oh. of those. Yeah. Terrific, terrific. Yeah. I just think that's great um, for further evidence of how coverlet design and quilt design overlap and intersect. Could be. Her. Very well could be because they're in the same area where they loved coverlets up until, you know, just about the time they started making applique quilts. So yes, I think patterns probably were drawn off suggestions from their coverlets. That one from the Quilts of Tennessee survey is oh. one of my favorites and it's owned by a museum now in Jonesboro. But 
Wow. We it's were, it is so different than anything we saw in Tennessee. I, there aren't that many of them. No. <laughs> I have a file. I'll have to go back and look for the exact same movement. But I, I do want to point out, you showed one from, I think, from Kentucky. And I have found an identical tree made by the famous Virginia Ivy of Kentucky for her Henry Clay quilt, which has stuffed pictures of Henry Clay's tomb or statue. That is identical to that oh. other. Are you going to blog about that, I hope? Yes, as soon as I get all the work. Oh, good, good. I didn't even realize it was the same quilt because I've had a, this file going on with yeah. this quilt for a while. And so when I pulled it out the other day, I realized it was the one you were talking about. Yeah, it's... it's. I have a feeling I you're going to see... It, you know, what did the Ivy do for a living? Is my thing. But, hmm. I think you're going to see some from uh, people who view this. Mm -hmm. You know, I just think that, that uh, I've seen it several times um over the years and i think they're out there you can see some invitation friends yeah it's a great graphic motif it's just so appealing yeah it's pretty and deeply deeply symbolic as well oh yes well that's true. so many ways yeah <laughs> okay alden, alden so, oh sorry yeah. <laughs> you have to introduce me i'm all raring to go Hello, Alden. I'm Julie. Uh, <laughs> Alden. Alden O'Brien is the costume and textile curator at the DAR Museum, specializing in late 18th and early 19th century clothing and quilts. Her exhibitions include Eye on Elegance, Early Quilts, Virginia, and Culture in American. Um, thank you. And I just think it's great happenstance that um, Debbie was doing um, something that made reference to uh, coverlet design because I'm going to talk about a quilt that was also influenced by coverlet design. Oh, yes. And if any of you, oops, let me put it on slideshow. Um, any of you who uh, saw my piece of her mind Culture and Technology in American Quilts Exhibit will have seen this. Um, and it's online at a piece of her mind.dar.org. Um, and it's made by Mary King. And this is one of the first quilts that I accessioned after I um, became curator of the textile collection after Nancy uh, Gibson um, left. Um, and I was still kind of finding my feet and going, how am I going to know what I should take? And this walked in and I said, I don't, no <laughs> question, we're taking it. Obviously we're taking it. And it's just, a, you know, a really superb red and green apple cake. And I really love it because for one thing, um, the, the, there are two signatures. Um, one is here and one is here. And it just says, Mary King period. In fact, it says Mary, period, King, period. I just love how emphatic she is that she should get um, credit. But at first we could, we were confused because the donor said this was made by her great grandmother or whatever, Verlinda M. King. And she keeps appearing in all the censuses and all the records as Verlinda or Lindy or Lynn or whatever, and never as Mary. And we said, well, that doesn't seem to fit. Maybe it was her mother because she would only have been a teen uh, at the time this was made, but we could not find any documentation of the mother's name. And fortunately, Debbie Coney uh, was doing some research to help um, me out with the uh, preparations for this exhibit. And by golly, Debbie found uh, Mary King was in fact for Linda's mother and her dates work better for being the uh, maker of this beautiful quilt around 1850. But what's really interesting is these four motifs of birds that um, that you see the detail of here. And I kept looking at these birds and saying, that is a very definite species or type of bird. And where did that come from? And was there some botanic, um, some, you know, uh, ornithological print that had them, or where did this come from? And then I was going one day through the coverlet collection and I found we have three coverlets in this design, which the coverlet collectors call the bird of paradise um, 
uh, design or birds in the nest. Birds of paradise, um, there's more than one species, but some of them do look like this with these you know, wild curlicue feathers on their backs and, and these plumy tails and the curlicues on their heads. And just look how similar um, these are. I mean, there's just no question that, you know, and you've got, you've even got the three layers of the, you've got the, whoops, you've got the, sorry, backspace. You've got the, um, the birds uh, bending down in mirror image. So that would have been easier for the weaving program, the jacquard cards to program a mirror image. Uh, you've got four little birds. You've got the um, this part of the nest. You've got that part of the nest underneath. And then you've got this thing underneath, kind of uh, stylized and simplified down to these, these um, three rows here. So, um, and then I, when I was preparing this talk, I thought, I've never compared the flower pots. So I compared the flower pots and they look sort of at first glance as if they might be um, similar, but, and you know, you've got these grape things, uh, these grapey looking things uh, off on the sides, but then there are these things circled in red here um, that don't actually match the, what's going on the quilt in the quilt. So I don't think she's trying to copy the motif from the coverlet. Um, and what we know is she was at Mary King was in Western Pennsylvania. Um, there were coverlet weavers in that area, but we don't know what they were weaving. And the coverlet weaver who uh, whose coverlet I showed you before, we do know where he was. He was in Ohio, but nowhere near Mary in Pennsylvania. So the question becomes, you know, maybe um, maybe she saw the coverlet because someone else in her community had a coverlet from a weaver somewhere in ohio or pennsylvania maybe uh one of the weavers in her area was making this design we don't really know but there are several you know possible plausible ways for this to have happened because as i say we do have other coverlets um, by unknown weavers but with ohio and pennsylvania provenances and they may have been closer closer to Mary. So I tried to play Barbara Brackman's Photoshopping game, but I don't actually have Photoshop. Oh. So this is the best I could do with paint, which is not Wonderful. great. But it's kind of good to get that outline. And then I superimposed them like this. Oh. And it's not a perfect match. Clearly, she didn't absolutely trace it. But it's pretty darn close. And um, then since the this is not the only you know, all those designs look almost look identical, but there are slightly slight variations in some of these birds in the nest designs. Here's another one. So I tried that. This seems to be a little bit closer, but not a perfect match. So, you know, she may have freestyle drawn it or she may have traced it. And then when you turn it into fabric, it's hard to get those little fine tuned designs. Um, and uh, and this um, is kind of interesting because we were just talking about the influence of of coverlets, and so I think it's it's interesting to remember that you know quilts were not the only textiles pe people were surrounding themselves with, and they were getting um, inspiration from other places. Uh, when I was preparing the exhibit, I was thinking of trying to make a compare comparison between Burgoyne surrounded here. Um, one of my friends thinks I'm crazy to see a connection here. The coverlet example here is not as close as some of the other coverlet designs that that are even more reminiscent of these um, of this design. But I think it's um, kind of interesting to take a look at that and remember that people were the quilt makers were getting their inspiration from all over. And there was actually a um, uh, a whole exhibit at the American Coverlet Museum in Pennsylvania um, about this using um, guest curated by Virginia Gunn using quilts from her collection called Comfortable Cousins. And this, um, this catalog is still available. And it's great because on one page, it'll have a coverlet design. And on the other page, it has a quilt with a very similar motif. So um, I think it's worth taking a look at. And I just, it's um, one of my favorite um, quilts, and it was a really fun eureka moment to realize where those bird came, birds came from. Yes. So that's it. I will now stop sharing. Well, I saw that show, and I was just knocked out by that comparison. Thanks. Thanks. It was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Yeah, the show was about where, you know, where women were influenced by their motifs and what they wanted to say on their quilts. And, and so um, I had that, uh, that section had that quilt with the coverlet and then an Indian palum poor bedspread with the tree of life um, framed from Dalian quilts as two examples of where you could get your inspiration from other textiles. When I did my, my, um, Northern Comfort exhibition at Old Sturbridge Village in 1998. Um, it was so much fun to, to realize the comparison of a weaving draft in the library collection by oh. Patience Kirby. Uh, and they actually labeled it. It's from the 1790s, you know, their dates and when they were operating all that. 1790s and they labeled their weaving draft orange peel right orange peel right hard word to spell. and it when it was woven up which the interpreters in the village did when the when it was woven up it was the quilt orange peel pattern there you go you see yeah. So I mean, Thank you. I, I think that's just a, a connection there that is unquestionable it's unquestionable um yeah and it no, also shows it, that these might have been getting names pretty early too well that's true too and, and it, but, especially if they are influenced by the weaving drafts because those weaving drafts do more often have names were those weaving drafts sold i'm sorry what were the weaving drafts sold could you buy I've only seen hand drawn ones yeah these were hand drawn hand, yeah hand Script, it seems whatever. to be a motivation to name something if you're going to sell it. Mm -hmm. It's yours. So. That's an interesting question, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, yeah. taking the pattern off, I I've been reading the wonderful letters of, of a woman named Anna Maria Calhoun Clemson, who lived in South Carolina, and she, her daughter is going to school in Philadelphia. And here's a line from, from Anna Maria. She says, you know how to take a pattern off needlework, don't you? You you rub it with a spoon. Sorry, with a what? Spoon. Spoon. So, I'm That's thinking, interesting. You no, know, I'm thinking, how would you do that? I wonder if you take a silver spoon. Preferably one that's tarnished. Yes. I don't know. I'm going to try a tarn. I've got many tarnished silver spoon and I don't know what she meant, but you know, her daughter apparently did. She didn't explain it any further. Um, huh. But or would it just be embossed and that oh, would, it would be yeah. embossed too. And I was wondering if you could, you probably in a cover, like you could probably get that embossing like a grave rubbing. You know? hmm. But she didn't say you rub it with a spoon and some powder. She said you rub it with a spoon. So I'm wondering about a tarnished spoon. But there's got to be some other surface. That's a digression. Okay. I'm wondering, do we know other people who are working on the relationship between the designs of coverlets and quilts? Besides Judy Go? Suzanne McDowell is really working a lot at MESDA on yeah. uh, cool. Rashad coverlets. May, I mean, so, and she's also a quilt person. So she's a real good person I go to. And of course, Virginia Gunn. Virginia really has. Yeah. Seems like as many coverlets as she has right. quilts. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I well, just... she she made some really nice pairings in that catalog, and I was really excited to hear about that exhibit as I was preparing for um, a piece of her mind because that that helped validate my sense that you know that there were more examples of this cross pollination out there, um, and. It was really cool to see what she came up with. Julie, lots to lots to go on that one. Yeah. Now your turn. My turn. Me. Um, Julie, I'm a quilt lover, amateur quilt sleuth, author, buyer and seller of antique and vintage quilts. I was the curator of quilt exhibitions, including American Quilts: A Handmade Legacy at the Open Museum in 1981 and Amish, the Art of the Quilt at the Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco. 
uh, was also a full-time curator at the Street Book Collection in San Francisco for a whole bunch of years, and I'm a recent convert to Zoom and Zoom lectures. So let me see what I can pull up here and talk to you about something. Uh, the story of uh, the quilt I'm showing started in the mid-70s um, in the Bay Area. Uh, I, was, I had a shop. And um, a friend of mine had an antique store um, in San Francisco, a guy. And one day he called me and he said, you need to get yourself down to Deacons right away. The Deacons is a moving and storage company. And they, have a, they had a shop in San Francisco where they sold unclaimed goods. And in that shop was a caged off area for the very um, most valuable things. And, um, I listened to him and my partner Linda and I went right to San Francisco. We went there, we asked the woman to unlock the cage. Um, she did and there was a folded up quilt that looked kind of black. And this is what we found. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Oh. And this is what we found when we opened it up. And both Linda and I literally gasped and rocked back a little bit with the power of this quilt. So immediately we said to the woman who let us in the cage, tell us everything you know about this quilt. And honest to God, she yelled across the room. She said, Mary, didn't a piece of paper come with this quilt? <laughs> yeah, but we threw it away. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, moral of the story, people out there, please label your quilts and put it on fabric and tack it to the back of the quilt, uh, not just paper. Um, so began uh, no information at all. And so we wanted to know several things and um, had an immediate um, <laughs> impression of what this was. And I bet it's the one that you all are having as well. Very, very much looks like a morning quilt. And um, we wanted to look more carefully and see what we could find. Mm. Lot of questions, a lot of questions. <laughs> Here's the center of the quilt. Um, it appears to be a coffin shape. It appears to be a flower, uh, a lily of some sort coming out of a vase, a bunch of hearts and other embroidered and appliqued pieces of fabric. And um, once I was giving this talk, before I knew much about the quilt at all, I was giving this talk at a guild and I uh, referred to this as a cow lily. And um, a young woman came up to me and she said she wasn't a quilter, but she was there with another, but she was a botanist. And though that wasn't a cow lily, that was what she called an alba lily. And what she said was, it only grows on the west coast of the United States. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Beacons, this thing could have come from anywhere, anywhere in the United States. And so we wanted to see what we could find. And uh, I thought that was interesting. Um, which I'll talk about again in a minute. Uh, when we looked a little bit further, we saw um, all this naval stuff and patriotic stuff and a ship and uh, flags that um, suggested the Navy. On another piece of the quilt is a man who um, is next to a shield that actually has stars on it that you can't see very well in this photo. Pieces of fabric that seem very fancy, maybe part of a fancy dress, a wedding dress. Household objects, fan, knives, baby, children's blocks, um, a chair. Um, and I'm holding an umbrella over a little girl. Um, and here a kitty cat. Um, pieces of a life, it seems. Then we found this, which is grapes. And grapes are um, sometimes associated with California and more so than um, many other places in the US. And so now we're getting to think, maybe is it possible that it's actually Northern California? Going a little further, here is the lily again. And close up, you can see the young woman said to me it had something to do with the veins. And again, she called it an Alba lily. And um, I asked on Facebook the other day if anybody could help identify it for me. And um, it turns out that most people felt it was an Easter lily because in Christianity, it's a symbol of the resurrection of Christ. But 
The other thing we found out is that currently nearly all Easter lily bulbs used in the North, used in North America are grown on the coastal bottomlands in Northwest California and Southwest Oregon, particularly in the town of Smith River, California. So now it's starting to seem like maybe this quilt was actually local in some way. And then we found the smoking gun. Um, the smoking gun is this printed on the selvage, printed on the border, which is the selvage edge of the fabric, Taft and Penoyer guarantee. And when I first saw it, um, since I'm an amateur, <laughs> and uh, I didn't think too much of it, although anybody in the right mind would think you'd find out what that is. And so I did, I found out what it was. And here's what it is. Taft and Penoyer guarantee. And there's a building in Oakland, California called Taft and Penoyer, and here's what it is. Taft and Penoyer, Oakland, California's largest dry goods stores operating from 1880 to 1912. So now, and it's the only one. It's the only one. It's a single, they didn't have any branches. So now we know that it came, the fabric came from Oakland. And the fabric is the same throughout, by the way, the background fabric. So one of the questions that I'm going to put to you, um, I'm going to finish this and then we can get to questions. But one of the questions I'm going to put to you, um, let me tell the audience that we don't know what the other what other people are presenting. And um, this is a surprise. Each one is a surprise to all of us. Um, I got to looking at this quilt and it seems to me that it's a crazy quilt. You can't see the seams, but it's a crazy quilt. Random shaped pieces with this embellishment of embroidery and applique. Um, but I think that I have seen doubts that have been removed. And my question, in, someone's question was when they looked at this, could this fabric be the fabric of her morning dress, a widow making a quilt all about her life, maybe, uh, maybe about the war, uh, 1898. Um, could this be, and could this piece, which is one piece, be the broad collar of a morning dress? So uh, a couple hours ago, I spoke with Lynn <laughs> Bassett and said, I got a question for you, Lynn. Around 1900 or 1910, did morning dresses have large collars? And what did you say, Lynn? Well, you asked me if dresses had large collars. Dresses in general had yeah. large collars. And, okay. and they did. They had very wide, lapel-like yeah. collars. Well, somebody's going to be able to look at this quilt close up, and I'll bring it the next time we all are together. Um, because I would really love to know there's something so moving about the idea, and this is not fact, this is just you know, questioning. Could this possibly be her wedding dress she took part and then put all this stuff about her life in? So here are the clues and questions. Who made the quilt? Where did they make it? When did they make it? And why was it made? And my thoughts were, is the quilt associated, associated as it appears to be with death and mourning and if so how? We know that the center lily is a type that grows only on the west coast of the US and might the grapes also suggest the west coast origin. The fabric came from a department store with one location only in Oakland, California, 1880 to 1912. All the flags and patriotic stuff, is that in the, all together in one corner? Is that telling us something about him? And who knows? What is the large star-like shape surrounding the coffin shape? And um, all of these are questions, you know, um, I have feelings about this quilt, <laughs> obviously. Um, I have a feeling about what it is. And um, so I've made up a story about it and I'm gonna share it with you even though it's not, based entirely in fact by any means. Looking at the quilt, the embroidery stitches are here very even, like look here, very even and calm. And then there's all this jaggedy stuff. 
So I'm just gonna go with my fantasy that this quilt was made by a widow about her husband and that the quilt represents the period of mourning when feelings would be common even and jagged and who knows what, or am I making this whole thing up and was it just a design decision by the quilt maker that had nothing to do with her mood? Um, but that's what it brought up for me. So I'm done and you guys need to bring me back to reality, I think. Alden, do you wanna go first? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll i just say, uh, because I spent a lot of time looking at, at crazy quilts for peace of her mind, um, that Lily, I find it really compelling that it only grow, that this kind only grows on the west coast of, of California and all of that that fits in with the Pinoyer and so on. Um, and I also find it compelling that it does look kind of like a so coffin shape and it's very bold and central and important so that that adds to the possibility of the you know the death and resurrection theme and these certainly are something you see at you know funerals and all over the damn place on easter sunday if you're allergic to that pollen you know don't go to church on easter sunday um just as a slight taking down a notch it's also a very popular motif in the aesthetic movement that you see on a lot of crazy quilts um like that japanese fan like the cats like the the umbrella or parasol like some of the other things you see here uh the butterflies but um the fact that it's so emphasized within that shape um it is compelling to me so i don't know quite what to make of it and that's all i have to say I just want to finish up with my romantic fantasy here. The entire shirt here, the coffin shape is filled with hearts, all of uh, them double except for this one, uh, a single heart, and it appears to be, you guys stop me, it appears to be falling. The others are straight up and the single heart is falling um, to add to my fantasy. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Your fantasy is certainly based on a lot of visual clues. Yeah. I want to say about the lily. Crazy quilts and the aesthetic movement really had a lot of affiliation with the Oscar Wilde tour of the United States. Thank you. Louise Tiemann has done an awful lot of work on Oscar Wilde imagery. You know, there's croutons with Oscar on them. But one of the things Oscar did was he carried that lily. Now, it might not have been the same lily, but he carried a white lily onto the stage. And so that's a very common motif. But mm -hmm. this is uh, this is just different. And also, I want to point out that the um, the center of that coffin shape is done in different technique. Everything else is outline embroidery, and this is applique plus embroidery. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason that that lily is so defined. Is that it? And that is another aesthetic movement. That's the kind of thing the Royal School of Needlework taught you to do. She did not outline every piece. The seams flow into each other. It's as if she made a canvas and then did what she was going to do. And I just want to just remember that the guy who told me to go see it was a painter. He was an antique stealer, but he was a painter as well. And he said to me, Julie, I've never seen anything like it. It looks to me like a scratched narrative. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, those, when kids make color, 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 a different color, and then black and then scratch. Oh, yeah. That's how he, that's what he saw. And it is interesting in that the embroidery seems to have nothing to do with the shape of the pieces, the background pieces. The, there's a couple of, there's a few things um, if I could throw in here. Um, first, that lily just looks so much better done, you know, technically than the rest of the quilt. Yeah. I just question if that was done by somebody else, maybe, or if it's a purpose. Of something. I mean, that were commercially done on a dress or something, and then they were really cut out. I don't know. It's not the sort of thing that you would typically see on a dress in that way. Um, I also want to caution that just because the background fabric is black, that doesn't mean it's mourning. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> For sure. It's kind for of sure. shiny for morning. 
at best it's it was actually I, honest to god it's not this shiny it's oh, really okay. not this shiny it was the the photo let me see if i can get back to the first one because uh yes. to symbolism no, I'm I'm glad Lynn said that because I'm always very hesitant about people saying, oh, it's a morning quilt just because it uses black and costume people do this too. It's a black dress, therefore it's morning. Everyone had a black dress. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there is a lot of symbolism here that. Yeah, I, I mean, I see the, the pansy there on the left. That was a, a sign of sympathy and and um, thoughts. Ponce French, you know, French word for thoughts. Ponce became pansy. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I'd really like to know is where the actual seams are of the black fabric and see if that corresponds to clothing the, part, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. Uh, a dress that's been taken apart. That collar shape that you're talking about in the center, that's, that's um, too big to be. The and quilt, by the way, is supposed to be inches by 62 inches. I'm sorry, it's what? The size of the quilt is about 60 by 62. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'd really like to um, see where the, the, the black is pieced. I can't wait to bring it over, Lynn. I just yeah. can't wait to yeah. bring it over. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, let's move on. We're going to go to Mary. Well, it really Lynn. looks to me like two or three people uh, worked on it with the, some mm. of it being beautiful and other so jagged. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's also a, a lesson in don't um, anthropomorphize size here. Right. Don't, don't I mean, I, I hope yeah, I'm making it really up. clear. The story I made, and I'm not saying it's true. I'm just, um, you know. Now, as the person who has worked in mental institutions will tell you, sometimes people lose touch with reality and their sewing gets very erratic. <laughs> Grief will do that too. All right, let me um, hold on one second here and I will introduce Mary Kay. Mary Kay. Mary Kay Waldvogel is a quilt historian and author from Knoxville, Tennessee. Her quilt research spans a broad swath of quilt history from 19th century Southern quilts and patterns through 20th century quilts and quilt makers. Her books include Quilts of Tennessee, Soft Covers for Hard Times, Patrick and Souvenirs of the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, and Southern Quilts, Surviving Relics of the Civil War. Mary Kay. Okay, I hope it's springtime where you are. It's the irises are in bloom in uh, Tennessee, and I I just decided to talk about this quilt that's in my my collection. I've had a long time. It's an iris quilt. I knew it was a mountain mist pattern, and um, soon after I got it, I heard about a woman who had the correspondence of Margaret Hayes. And here she is on the right. She was corresponding with Stearns and Foster in Cincinnati and helping to design the earliest quilt patterns for their line of quilt patterns that appeared on the batting wrappers. So my quilt, you'll note it's not in the best condition at the top. But it had a date on it, 1933, and it does match exactly the Mountain Mist pattern R at, with a copyright of 1930. I collect a lot of things, and I have done a lot of research on Mountain Mist. And I even have an original roll of, it's called Quilting Cotton, not batting at this point. And, um, I've never unwrapped it. I've never taken the wrapper off. So that's the real cotton and the real wrapper. So I get a chance to show it. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a 1932 mountain mist uh, wrap batting. And you'll notice that it has the pattern R by 1932 
the pattern has reached the, the batting wrapper. While we're here, you could notice in the, in the bottom left of that, you'll see pattern X of New York Beauty. So it's being called New York Beauty as early as the early 1930s. Now, you know, when you turn over the wrapper, there's a free pattern inside. And although this wrapper is from 1963, it's the only one I have of the iris. And they use the very same print layout from 1930, probably up to now. May, they may have changed it a little bit recently, but here we are. There's a lot of information on these wrappers and it's fun to compare the, my quilt to uh, the instructions on how it was made, colors and et cetera. What's really unusual about the pattern design is the shape. It's an elongated hexagon and you could see it here. This hexagon goes up here, goes down like this and over here. So the woman who made my quilt, I don't know who it is, followed the, um, the pattern exactly, including putting the green along the, um, along here. It's fun, this little color chart was also on the, uh, the instruction sheet and I've enlarged it here. And it's telling you what, what colors to use. And they, they kind of, it's not a random uh, coloration. They usually are doing one in the one, they, they go back. If you really look at this, you'll see that there's similar patterns similar color combinations the whole way down. And she follows it pretty closely. So after I got that quilt, like I said, I came upon um, a woman called me one after called, I, I called, anyway, she called, she called my husband. He said, yes, my wife would like to talk with you. She was the niece of this woman, Margaret Hayes, seen here on the right. And Margaret Hayes, of course, had died. This is in about 19, early 1990s. And she was a freelance artist for Stearns and Foster. And Fritz Hooker worked at Stearns and Foster. And he had come up with this idea of making, putting colorful patterns on the outside. And I don't think he ever at that point thought about selling them, but he saw it as a way to make a brown paper wrapper much more uh, colorful and attractive. He needed an artist though. Apparently he went out and just picked these patterns randomly. And I think you can see that some of these look awfully familiar. Like some of them look a lot like a Marie Webster pattern. Hmm. And so he wrote to Margaret and he said, I need some help. And here we have one for, you know, a really strong example. What you're looking at on the left is this mock-up. Uh, it was a, there's a date on it, 1928. It was never published. It didn't have a pattern on the inside, but he sent it to Margaret Hayes and they still have this original mock-up uh, wrapper with the correspondence. Mm -hmm. So I have pulled out this pattern right here, make it bigger, and then I'm comparing it to the Marie Webster quilt that appears, it first appeared in Ladies Home Journal in 1911. It was a quilt made by her. And then she published it in color in her book, Quilts or Stories and How to Make Them that came out in 1915. So what he, it looks like he's done is just gone to the library, found quilts, this Marie Webster, um, a book and is taking this pattern out and he put it on his wrapper and now people are asking, well, I want the pattern for this. <laughs> and Margaret is supposed to try to make a pattern out of that complicated thing. And indeed she did try for quite a while. But by, by December, this is a letter from him to her. This is about the fourth one talking about the, the iris. He's kind of given up and he's basically saying, We, 
well, let's jump, jump down to this time. At the time we first arranged the designs on the Mountain Mist wrapper, we were unaware that in adopting our iris design, we were following very closely a design for which someone else already had patterns. We therefore wish to have our iris pattern considerably different from the way it appears on, and he's talking about that mock-up of 1928. I think it would therefore be advisable to discard the old sketches you have made and lay out something entirely new. And this is the, the sketch that she sent next. And it is entirely new. She's an artist. She's actually, um, uh, she, she and her, daughter, her sister grew flowers for um, local florists. Um, she knew an iris and she, she drew it <clears throat> more realistically than most quilt uh, people would do. Maybe Marie Webster's is pretty close. Now, the same thing happened with the sunflower. Good old Fritz Hooker put the sunflower on that mock-up. And here's the original one that Marie Webster, again, made in 1911, public, it appeared in Ladies Home Journal then, and then she included it in her book. And so Margaret went ahead and was told to redo that design too. So here is the design, copyright 1930, Mountain Miss Pattern P as it appeared on the wrapper beginning in 1930. So that's the end of my, my little explanation. And it, I did write about it in Uncoverings 1995, volume 16. And I encourage you to look for it on the quilt index. And there's, there's Margaret. So if you have any um, comments, that would be, I need to stop sharing. Is that right? Oops. How do I get back that you are? Oh, stop share. How, how long was her career with Mountain Mist? Not very long. That's a good question. She, it was about 1929 through early part of 1930. But a woman named Phoebe. Mm -hmm. But that's critical, you know, in the very starting story of Mountain Mist. So that's really amazing that that found its way to you, hooray. Yeah, these things happen to me all my life. It's <laughs> great. So, nice. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, we can we can blame or credit Fritz and Margaret for changing the name of the Rocky Mountain and the or the I, uh, <sighs> Crown of Thorns to New York Beauty, which is so nice. indelible. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. Said, well, We're in uh, Tennessee, maybe. You know, I. Uh, Praise the entire collection in Mountain Mist had kept. Mm -hmm. um, that's now at, the, at, at Nebraska. Right. And, um, it was very clear that the, the New York Beauty, the Crown of Thorns, the old one, was among those. Right. So you may actually have right. people bought real cooks. That's right. That's exactly. I did talk to Fritz Hooker's, he had died, but I was able to interview his sister. And she said, yes, um, he traveled through Ken Kentucky, Tennessee, looking for antique quilts mm. to include them in that, that time. Really, and keeping them and sort of taking a copyright on them, right? Say that again? I think he took a copyright on them. He, he, he took chromosomes, the old one, yes. wow. tweaked it, gave it a new name, and then copyrighted it. That's right. That's fascinating. And it's interesting that it's right at the time, 1928, there is an issue with copyright and there's also a lot of advertising um, coming out at that point. So he was, he was ahead of the game um, and he looked for an artist to do something modern, you know, and when you think about it, this pattern is still as, it's 90 years old now and it, it's still as beautiful and holds up. Um, as, as any pattern, it's. There was a fantastic modernistic design in the upper right hand corner oh. 
of that. Did you ever see one of those made up? Oh, I know which one you're talking about. Oh my gosh. No. Oh my gosh. Now it looks like drafting with, yeah, with triangles. I should go back to that maybe. Uh, yeah, show us that. Oh my gosh. I've never yes, seen the, uh, Never. It's never on. Heard. Oh, share. Uh, right. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And yeah. this one was okay. This one is called Shamrock. And see, these are the ones that he came up with, and they were way too complicated to be. Let me make this a. Yeah. And I didn't know. really know what it was like to piece right. or applique a quilt. And I don't think he ever thought it was going to be a, um, oh. hmm. a final thing. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, okay, so this happened right at the time that the company was what there's I uh, and it was a major, it was either the centennial or the seven, maybe anyway, maybe it's the hundred and fiftieth anniversary. And Linda Pumphrey was working at Mountain Mist. And she then, oh my gosh, she got into the vault, she found all the quilts. They made at least one quilt, sample quilt out of all these patterns. And then they they had quilt shows at state fairs. And you know, the, the whole idea was to try to sell more batting. But anyway. The that I saw when I was there, uh, um, appraising them, were yeah. incredibly well known. They gave the patterns to such good quilt makers. And they weren't all, there wasn't one for each pattern because it had been. I think they at one time had that, but uh, boy, were they masterfully made. Yeah, and those were people from, again, Kentucky, Ohio. Those were professional quilt makers, and uh, they did get paid for it. And they, some of them even appeared in some of the advertising mm -hmm. for, the, for these patterns. But anyway, Linda actually found a, she found the original, a whole set of these original patterns in their archives. And I, I bet that has gone on to Nebraska also. But this one actually was worked up into a pattern sheet, an instruction sheet, but never was sold. And this one, isn't it wonderful? Somebody ought to make that. This one, a lot of people like, it's called a little, uh, it, it, it became come a, a crib quilt. Can't right? Can't Mm -hmm. uh chantelier chantelier chanticleer chanticleer right so i haven't seen that one very often the, the mountainous actually had a made up one for right. all my years i've only seen one block i've never seen a full quilt i've seen one block hmm. all my years i wonder if it's difficult to make hmm. Well, it's kind of order has little chicks around it with little egg, little chicks coming out of the eggs. Now Margaret did that. Margaret worked on that one too. Uh, she really should get a lot of credit for those. The tail, I think, would be a little intimidating. You have to cut those strips and applique them smaller. Yeah, it's pretty fussy, I would smaller think. Smaller and smaller. Have any of you seen the quilt made up? An old one? I I've seen some. Not an... Maybe the same one you've seen. Well, the one I saw was I at Mountain Mist. And they had it as a uh, had it as a sample. Oh look, I I have okay. a question about the the sunflowers. Yes. The one that was developed from you know inspired by the Marie Webster still looks pretty darn close to the Marie Webster. I'm just wondering if there's ever any. Yeah. Um, well, people get confused. They do get confused. She just took away some sunflowers. Really. Yeah, I'm just wondering if Marie Webster ever got annoyed. <laughs> I think she was, and I think he had been contacted. I just had the feeling the way he wrote the that. Way he yeah, yeah, himself. yeah. That's what I was thinking. That you know, he kind of got a cease and desist letter or something. He sent her. He sent her a picture from National Geographic of a sunflower. It was designed, I mean, it was an illustration that was very simple. 
and that's she that's where she came up with the idea for the hmm. the simplified sunflower but Marie yeah, but this looks more art nouveau you know very realistic and really close and margaret hayes's is i think more art deco it's it's more modern yeah. it's open it's yeah but still cleaner lines yeah <laughs> it yeah. was it was yeah pretty close well, the marie webster version is very hard to find i i've only seen a couple of them sold mm. ever hmm. well, what about this iris i looked am i getting ready for this show i couldn't find one mm. and the only one i found was the one you know i took from the book and i think the quilt is in the indianapolis art museum. Yeah. anyway it's i think 20th century is i mean you get an extra dose of stuff to look at ephemera you could use oral interviews and sometimes you know things come out of the attic that uh, like that we did Hello, friends. Thanks for joining us for this third episode of Six Quilt, Six Know-It-Alls. And we are delighted to know that some of you also joined us for the preceding two. Um, the six of us have uh, refined and redefined and tweaked how we want to do this. And we're happy to announce that we've decided to do uh, these episodes monthly, going to be on a Wednesday every month and um, we'll keep you posted you can get in touch with us i'll tell you how at the end of this announcement um but we redefined this thing and we're going to continue and we're going to charge 15 dollars per session um which you can uh buy and you can buy tickets at eventbrite and we'll give you that information um it what buying a ticket entitles you to is the episode you're paying for and access to the last three. We will send you links for the at the first time that you buy a $15 ticket. The ticket also entitles you to be able to view the current episode for two weeks. It will not be available to the public, but two weeks past the time of the premiere, um, you can you can uh, see it again. Um, you can get in touch with us. We, we can give you information about how to buy a ticket and to get on our list for having announcements. And what we'd ask you to do, please, is to email us at sixknowitalls at gmail.com. And that's all the words spelled out, S-I-X, knowitalls at gmail.com. Once you do that, we'll be able to tell you how to get tickets and also what the, our schedule will be. We're um, loving doing this and we hope you are too. And we invite you to join us. We're gonna have a lot more fun. Thanks for coming this time.
Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. We're back. Ah, big bangs. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello, Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coordinating this. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. <laughs> So we we have a few questions coming in. If you guys want to get started, sure, sure. Uh, and then I'll pop out. Um, the first one I believe will be for Debbie. So it's about the cherry tree. It's from Pepper. Not not as much a question, more like a, perhaps just a yes, comment. Yeah, it's it there. It's, you, every time you see one of those trees, you think perhaps they were trying to make a biblical reference mm. on top of uh, the obvious. But it's uh, it's hard to know. Yeah, but it's certainly possible. Uh, then Julie, we have um, I'm not sure who this one is from. It's from a Facebook user uh, about the center motif on your crazy quilt. Mm -hmm. It might be a memory jar. Mm -hmm. What is a memory jar? African American. Uh, they made these giant jars and they uh, put uh, mosaics and memory things all over the jars. And that oh. became kind of a funeral. Um, well, that's, that's but, fascinating. But, but, but would an, a circa 1890-ish woman in Northern California know about that cultural reference? There Which black people there. Well, sure, but you know, white people have not been noticeably um, cognizant of black culture. It may not have been a white woman making it. That is also true. I was waiting for someone to go <laughs> to and say that because we uh, assume that these get made by white people, but it could have been, yeah. But overall, the aesthetic of that, it, Mo all the references are so, you know, just sort of American, European, whatever. But, you know, the thing I wondered about, um, nobody talked about the boat. That looks like the America's Cup boat. And, you know, oh, that okay. happened a lot. 
<clears throat> Am I correct, Julie? In the Bay Area, the America's Cup. Oh, you there you go. Yeah. Um, good point. Good point. I'll, I'll look into it. Yeah. The other thing was it, it turned out it was not an Alba Lily. Well, it's a little bit difficult. It was difficult for me to tell the difference between Alba Lily and Easter Lily. I think they're very close. Um, and they may be exactly this. It may be that an Alba Lily got named Easter Lily, you know, that they're not two separate things. Well, I looked up on Google. Oh, good. The Alba Lily is definitely, it's more like a pond lily. It's uh -huh. like, it has an upward, it's not mm -hmm. droopy like that. I see. Mm -hmm. It's definitely what we call today an Easter lily. Easter lily. Yeah. yeah. And about the, about the uh, container and the memory jars. Yes. Memory jars, as uh, Mary Kay just um, indicated with her hands, they tend to be, the ones I've seen, are bulbous. They're not, they're, this one is um, kind of elegant and tall and slender and mm -hmm. uh, memory jars. Is that right, Mary Kay, that they tend to be well, round? I put around. Yeah, more. Oh, oh. Yeah. Good, good idea, though. That's, Maybe somebody that's, else's idea. That's very, that, was, that is a really cool quilt. Really yeah. cool. Gonna, oh yeah, I saw right. Pepper comment on this, and of course that that is part of the the French tradition and so on. Um, there's no reason uh, to think that Americans couldn't have been trying to produce Marseille-style quilting um, over here, especially well, as we were Americans, trying to. Americans were doing Marseille-style quilting since at least the beginning of the 18th century, because I found a an ad in a Boston newspaper. Uh, for a needlework teacher, and they were offering French and English quilting, and so the French the French quilting is that Marseille. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you know, Americans were definitely doing the the French Marseille stuff from sure way 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 back. Um, we're just still in search of uh, documentation of workshops and commercial productions here in America, and you know, because it was probably employing a lot of women locally on you know. It's the kind of thing that may not have been advertised in the newspapers. It, you know, that really is a is a good point. I'm gonna have to, you know, as soon as I get vaccinated and can move around and all that sort of thing and get to these other quilts to do um, the mylar for all of them and to count the stitches in all of them, because I wonder if it really was kind of a um, sort of almost a, a domestic factory, you know, uh, organization for this that, you know, you had the, your designer and then you had multiple women doing the quilting. Yeah. Presumably women. Are they in that area? Was there, were there French or Italian or Mediterranean? Not, with, not no. particularly, no. But there was definitely a lot of interesting quilting going on and there was professional quilting a, a, a quilting industry a little later in the 19th century so maybe there's some outgrowth hmm. and then there's definitely a tradition for professional quilting um in, in, the, the, line in, the, area. in the french boutique do we ever see i don't think i have but do you ever see polka dots or is it isn't it mostly um it it's bigger the, designs, bigger designs. The um, why can't I think of the word? <laughs> it's terrible getting old. <laughs> yeah. tell, tell us, Lynn. <laughs> you know, it, it it's it's the the line. Courting, 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 courting. Thank you. Yes, the courting. <laughs> and a lot of florals. Uh, but, and, and and the embroidered accents and, and such more than the stuffing of um, larger motifs like that. Generally, not always the motifs can be, but I'd say it's, it's really a different aesthetic than what I see in the French, what I have seen in the French. But, but, um, but it's true that it could be an American 
um, take on product, it. trying to uh, piggyback on the popularity of the imported French things and just say, let's do this at home. Well, that's absolutely the case. I mean, I yeah. talked about and that. And that's exactly what we're, what we're saying, basically. Northern comfort, right? That, yeah. that you had the, the French Marseille and then you had the machine made Marseille. Yeah. Which was used as bed covers, which then inspired a, a handwork uh, again, so it's kind of a circular thing. Yeah. <laughs> the email address was um, six know it alls, all spelled out words at Gmail. Right, Julie? That's it. That's all it. Right. And I noticed that Pat um, Citus said that the America's Cup in the 19th century was on the East Coast. I don't okay. know. Yeah. Uh, it could still be a sailing ship. Yeah. I mean, we, we need someone who knows about ships to figure out what kind of a ship that is. Uh, no, uh, Edie, I, I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure that it's uh, the grapes are um, simply embroidered. They're not tattered. The maker of Alden's quilt. Oh, as I said, it was she was in uh, Northwest Pennsylvania, not terribly far from the Ohio border, but not very close to that. The one weaver whom we know was making those um, coverlets with the birds. Um, he was in known to be in three different locations in Ohio, none of which was within a hundred miles of her. Yeah, I yeah I think Pepper's responding to the um, about that in in North Carolina the textile mills that they might yeah. have been making the rough cloth but no, never made fine finished cottons for prints they made what we call gray goods right which was sheeting ticking and things like that just pretty close to it would have been cotton and cotton um, warp and weft but. Before we get back to the black quilt, can I um, comment? Um, I was thinking about this. We kind of got cut off because we were running out of time, but back to the idea of, of um, homespun and what exactly homespun is. Mm. And and um, I wanted to mention that manufacturers in the 19th century in the Civil War period and afterwards were, refer were referring, uh, were calling machine Mac manufactured plaids, homespun. So it's another use of the term. Um, and so it's not like it died out um, after the Civil War, but it, it came to mean plaids and that sort of thing. Interesting. When I interviewed people about the um, Lindsay quilts in Tennessee, and now these were people, you know, 1980s, who remembered it from the early 20th century. Hmm. They called, they called uh, a plaid, they'd say, oh, that's factory cloth. And I kind of like that idea, factory cloth as opposed to yeah. homespun. And, mm -hmm. and that was actually what they were, you know, we talk about the Mecklenburg or the, is that right? In North Carolina, the plaids. Um, oh. Uh, yeah. Alamance, and the Alamance yeah. plaid in Alamance County. Those are, I mean, they're, they're, they were particular to that area and they were cotton and cotton and they were meant to look like home woven mm -hmm. uh, goods, but it was factory cloth, basically right. manufactured factory cloth. Yeah, it's just like what we've talked about in other sessions that, you know, these fabric terms are so fluid. You just have to be careful about how you use them and what you think they mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same term can mean different things at different times and, and so and the same object can be described uh, by different words at different times. And also it's kind of funny to say factory cloth when by that time almost everything's made in a factory. So, you know, a brocade is a factory cloth, but they've just chosen this category to mean factory cloth, which is kind of interesting. So, all right, what else have you got for us? There are stuffed dots in a booty piece in Piquet de Provence. Good. Okay, okay. great. I'll write that down. 
Is that one of Kate Berenson's books? I um, yep. I don't have my uh, my own copies of those, and I can't get to the museum. So for looking things up, if I don't have it in my own library. Thank you, Don. What else have you got for us, Tara? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I think that's one of the things Julie was suggesting, isn't it? As part of my um, fantasy. No. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't completely counted it as fantasy. We're just, you know, being no, critical. But, but just being critical considerers of this. Um, and, you know, certainly, you know, we know that people have used needlework and, and crafting and, and art and quilting specifically as ways to process trauma. Um, process mourning and so on. It, it, um, you know, there are documented quilts that were made, um, you know, to mourn the loss of somebody. They just aren't necessarily black, and being black doesn't mean, make it mourning either. So, um, well, as we, we said, that. you know, there's a lot of iconography in Julie's quilts that points in that direction. So maybe, yeah. I'm thinking of the Eli Lilly quilt that was made at his bedside during his lengthy illness. Oh, wow. To family. And it's an album quilt, right, Debbie? I mean, you know what I'm talking about, the Eli Lilly quilt? Eli Lilly? No? No. Oh, okay. It's in, um, I think we may have used it in Hearts and Hands. It's definitely in the Orlowski's book, um, one of the early quilt books, uh, Quilts mm -hmm. in America, I think it's called. Um, there were five sisters, I think, and they and other family members and friends, according to the family, during the nine or ten months of his illness, which sounds like maybe it was cancer, some lengthy decline, by his bedside, according to the family, um, he signed one of the blocks. I'll, I'll, I'll post it, actually. Um, I, I yeah, that, that's yeah. the fun of this. Sorry for knocking oh, us down. Yeah. We can can post some follow-ups in our Facebook group and I hope I assume everyone knows the Facebook group because they probably found us that way um, quilt ampersand textile history programs is the name of the group on Facebook yeah um, on Facebook. and that quilt uh, every block is different every block is signed although I think if I remember it correctly it's the same handwriting but according to family history it was made during the the last of his um, months alive and has his own signature, which is inside a um, liar. Because Eli Lilly has written inside the picture, a drawing of, or an applique of what? Huh. Oh, wow. So, it's not in Safford and Bishop. I don't, it, so maybe it's no, Orlovsky. Said. I thought I had Orlovsky here, but all I have is Safford and Bishop. That's why I got up. Yeah. Now Lynn's gotten up to look at her shelf. <laughs> I have it, but it's not right in front of me here. It's downstairs. So I got it. Oops. There we go. Look up Eli Lilly. All right. What else can you send our way, Tara? Who else has a comment or something? Ah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, um, this is page 246. Sorry, I'm interrupting. That's all right. Pull it back a little bit. Oh, yeah. The Eli Lilly? Yes, that album. Well, and Sorry. tell us what it says, Lynn. Um, Baltimore County, Maryland, 1847. This death watch quilt was designed, sewn, and signed by friends and family of Eli Lilly present at his bedside during his final illness. Eli Lilly signed the block with the liar. Oh, cool. I've got some details. We borrowed it um, when we did the show at the Oakland Museum. We borrowed it, and uh, I think it was probably the last time. It, we actually borrowed it from the family, and I know, I think it's in Nebraska now. It's somewhere where it should be. Should be. Yeah. Janet Finley, uh, I don't have her book here. Of course, it's at the DAR library, Quilts in Everyday Life. Yeah, oh, looks like Mary Kay's going for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she said, yeah. Page 161, I think she said. Yeah. 
Uh, Lynn, what was that? Yes. What was the book that you finally found it in? It's in the Orlovsky's Quilvis Orlovsky. Orlovsky. Okay. okay. Were they different embroideries? Did yeah. You? Well, they're different. They're very different in style. And I think it was one of you who said that it looks like two different embroiderers, um, whereas my fantasy said that it was different moods of one person. But they're oh, yeah. that jaggedy stuff. I mean, yeah, that's really interesting. All that jaggedy mm -hmm. stuff, and 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 aesthetically, it's very powerful. I mean, it gives mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of uh, lightning action to the. Mm -hmm. did, did you guys find it as powerful as I do? Oh yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh um, yeah. Those chaggedy stitches are very eloquent, really. Yeah. What did Janet say that when she blew up this picture, she saw it was a? It was a coverlet, not a quilt. Interesting. Oh. Very interesting. Okay, it's hard to see there, but but it's, it's an Irish chain, maybe. So the, dif the difference between a coverlet and a quilt, when I say a coverlet, I'm talking about a woven bedspread, which is, um, there are three, three types, um, basically. One is the overshot weave, um, one is the double weave, sometimes called a summer winter, and one is a fancy weave, otherwise known as a jacquard. And the, the fancy or jacquard weave um, use a jacquard attachment to a loom, it can be a hand loom, to make a much fancier, more elaborate weave than, than you can uh, achieve otherwise with a plain uh, four or eight l harness loom. That may sound convincingly as if I really know what I'm talking about when it comes to weaving, but I know only the rudiments. Um, but in any case, um, the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian, NMAH, dot si dot edu has thank you an overshot coverlet fragment that's the kind of thing and what they are is first linen and then later cotton is that white color and then you have dyed wool in often blue often red sometimes green and other colors Mustard. in various combinations blue and white is arguably the most common red white and blue extremely common um, and they were very, very popular, widespread um, used uh, bedspreads aside from quilts. And um, you didn't have to be a professional weaver to, to make some of the overshot ones. I think you had to be a little bit more accomplished to do a double weave. And the jacquard attachment was something you had to pay a lot of a fair amount of money to you know put on so that would have been a professional weaver so the one that i was showing you was a jacquard or they would have called it a fancy cover letter fancy fancy weave now in america they often call um unquilted patchwork or applique things that we would call a quilt they often call them a coverlet if they aren't in fact three layers and quilted yeah, that's that's where so, the so we're, we're dealing with we're we're dealing with you know two countries separated by a common language. Um, thank you. There's the there's a typical fancy weave or jacquard woven coverlet like the like the birds, but here in America, this is what we tend to call a coverlet, and then at least you know many of us in the museum and and collecting and history of quilts world will call the one or two layers that is not quilted or filled uh we'll call that a counterpane or some people call it a summer spread etc so we have uh because this is what we this is what we in america call a coverlet in the in the 19th century they used the term bedspread too yeah yes yes oh. But of course, the bedspread can cover a lot of different, you know, Right. it's not specific enough. So I think when, you know, in museum cataloging terms, it's easier to say coverlet for these woven things. Well, I have, I've, got to, I've got to squeeze in this, this comment about your Mary King uh, quilt, Alden. Please do, um, yes. You had researched it up and down uh, for a long time, but... Um, the, the, when I got to it, it was many years after after you had done the primary research. Well, we acquired it in two thousand five. Yeah, yeah. The, the information popped up immediately, which means uh -huh. to me that the information you were looking for just wasn't posted. Yeah. So the, the moral of that story is keep trying to find 
um, even going back a few weeks later, sometimes things will look differently the way they're posted. But clearly in the years yeah. you first researched Mary King, uh, something all wasn't digitized. Right. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, something wasn't digitized that later was and allowed us to find Mary's mother. Um, and you would have thought that you could find her name in the census, but we, but we, I forget why, but we couldn't. Well, we eventually did when something else popped up that indicated mm -hmm. where she was. Yep. Thank you very much. It, uh, it's true. We had done our level best to find her, but um, anyway. Yay Ancestry and lay, yay Church of Latter-day Saint, Saints. Um, Edie, yes. Didn't Mount Miss do a whirling tulips pattern? Again, it was almost exactly like Marie Webster's pattern. Um, for some reason, they left it and uh, didn't change it. So huh. uh, I, I meant to go back and look in the, the letters to see if he, he commented on, on that one. But for some reason, they, they're the same. Huh. Could I share some more pictures that I, I brought? Um, let's see. Now, how do I do that? Oh, do you have an option? Yeah, sure. You have an option to share the screen at the bottom. Share the screen right there. Okay, there yeah. it is. And okay. And this is my mother. Hi, mom. Oh, hi, mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> okay. So we're right here. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, not yet. Uh oh. Okay. How do I? Um, You'll see, click on share and then share screen. And you may have it, you might have your browser blocking it. And if so, you can email me the image and I'll share it. Uh, there were four. Oh. Yeah. So what I learned uh, with sharing screen is you have to have it already open on your screen. I do have it open. You do. Okay. Because we got checking. It. Oh, thank you. In, in this particular software that we're using, if it's open in a um, an image viewing program, it won't share. So you'll need to drop it into a browser, a Chrome browser. Okay, so it's a PowerPoint. So you're saying that cannot oh, be shared. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can share a PowerPoint. Well, I don't know why it's not. Why don't I, you just I, pop, I, email it over to me and I'll pop it in. Okay. Um, all right, I'll I'll send it to you. But anyway, we're doing see. our best, folks. I don't. Oh, never mind. Let's let's not worry about it. Um, put it on the can, Facebook page. Yeah. What I'm what I meant to show you was. Um, oh. Well, I need to say this. A lot. Julie had alluded to this, and um, Linda Pumphrey really did a lot of work. Um, you know when. When those letters came to me and I went to Stearns and Foster, they, you know, normally you get a company that says, eh, that's interesting. You know, they're not really interested in their history. They weren't around then. Vicki Paulus was the Phoebe Edwards at the time. And uh, Linda Pumphrey was the Fritz Hooker at the time. And I think Linda was a little hesitant in the beginning they do many more things at Stearns and Foster than just quilt patterns. But to her credit, she invited me up there. And by the time I got there, maybe a month or so after the, I got these letters, she had already been into the vault. She pulled out all those quilts. She got ledgers. It was just, she shared with me an enormous amount of material that was left there at the company. And as you know, that over the years, now, that was when they were still in Cincinnati. The, the company has been bought out at least twice since. She's, she stayed with the company. And eventually, she saved all that material as they moved out mm -hmm. of the um, building. And, wow. and at least all the quilts are at um, Nebraska. And I, I bet a lot of the, the printing plates, the ephemera, it's huh. really an incredible thing. They put out a book. Um, it's called, it was put out by Leisure Arts, and I. that's another thing. I. Uh, it's called Mountain Mist Favorites, 
it was at the time of the their 150th anniversary, which was right after I had found these letters. And she, it's a great book if you can find it. It's Lavender on the Front, and it's called Mountain Mist Favorites. And it has the photographs of the quilts from their corporate collection and patterns. And one of them is the Chanticleer. And um, it's it's just wonderful. One And one of the neat things when I went there to Cincinnati and they pulled out the Mountain Mist example, I mean, the New York Beauty, and it was, it wasn't a 20th century quilt. You know, it was definitely a 19th century quilt. Absolutely. The green had faded to beige and they copied that exactly. I mean, the points are exactly the same. And, you know, it could have been like little uh, straight line, but it was the point. So anyway, that quilt, if you go to the International Quilt Museum website, they have a collection, the Mountain Mist Collection, and you could look at Chanticleer, you could look at their iris, you could look at, there was another antique quilt, it was the Princess Feather. It's huge. It was 92 inches by 92 inches, and it's that really good brown that we've been talking about in the South. And Fritz Hooker must have, you know, picked that up as an antique, and he asked Margaret Hayes to make that into a pattern that would fit on the back of a wrapper. And he couldn't really do it, but, and he didn't like the colors, and he made, he said, make them pastel, you know, so... He really had a lot to do with the change in the look of quilts in the 20th century. Hmm. I, I just want to ditto you on the giving Linda Humphrey credit because <laughs> my sense of it when we went there to um, vet them and appraise them and so on, um, my sense of it was that she was the one who gave them the idea that the new company, that it would have value at all. They were the, I can tell you by meeting them, they were the kind of people who were just going to throw it away. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that she's 100% responsible for at least having it um, vetted and appraised. And then I brokered it to the museum. So um, she deserves an enormous amount of credit. That's great. That yeah. 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 Good to know. Yeah. So we just saw a question from Pam Leakes asking if you'd looked at the semaphore flags. I'm so glad she asked that because I forgot to ask you that, Julie. Have we deciphered those flags? No, we haven't. We. <laughs> we. The royal we. The royal we. Guess what? We will. Okay. <laughs> we will. It's a great idea. Put it on the Facebook page. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we'll follow this up. And, you know, just to uh, interject here, we, in the first th uh, two that we did, um, a few of us made minor mistakes. And um, that would also be a good place to correct ourselves on some of the things that we kind of regretted that we said or whatever. Yeah. Uh, good idea, Pam, I'll do it. I had another question for, for uh, Debbie. When you said, when you're talking about that tree, now we're all gonna be looking for the tree block. Um, you said something about Ladies Art Company you, you didn't find a block, right? You no. were just saying that companies like Ladies Art Company yes. were putting out, that's what you meant. Pattern, right? yes, yes. But they didn't really do many applique patterns, did they? Well, they they had some. Now, they're not, not, not many. very many, no. Yeah. I'd say maybe 25, yeah. uh, maybe, you know, three or 400. I, right. Don't, right. don't quote me on that. But yeah, yeah, I was just trying to say that by, by the... 1890s turn of the century, there were some patterns being published. And so some a couple of these might have been eventually been patterned, but have they haven't turned up if they if they were. They might have been in some well, I don't know. Those were pretty early. I mean yeah. 1880s or oh yeah, but I I meant that the quilts that that I, I showed a couple of later quilts that could have okay. gone into the 20th century. And okay. I suppose it's possible that a pattern existed for those, a published pattern, but it, it's kind of unlikely, but mm -hmm. until they turn up, you don't know for sure. Right. Can't prove a negative. Right. 
<laughs> well, it looks like we have addressed all of the questions and comments that we have. Is that it? That's it. Well, let's remind, let's all remind right. everybody, let's just remind people that if they want to continue to see um, our episodes, the six know-it-alls, we're going to be doing it monthly, and there will be tickets available at Eventbrite. Mm -hmm. And although we, Tara, am I right that we don't have a link to that yet? Right. That's that's correct. We will be posting all of that information on a dedicated six know-it-alls page at quiltdistrict.com. So you can check the Facebook group and also um, quiltdistrict.com for that information. Or email us at six know-it-alls um, at gmail.com and we will uh, use your email to let you know um, everything that we update. Yes. We hope to see you again. We, Absolutely. We but really, really we, have a great, we have a great program. We're all going to be talking about different quilt myths and looking yeah. at each of us will look at a quilt that uh, defies one or another myth. Yeah. Who are you going to call? <laughs> myth busters. <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to quickly let you guys know of um, a couple of exhibits that Alden has happening. Um, I believe are th these are going on no. now, right? No, these are previous exhibits that are still online. I mentioned a piece of her mind because that's where the Mary Quilt, uh, Mary King quilt wa was, and Ion Elegance also has uh, quilts that I've talked about in previous programs and. Okay, so, great. And those, and exhibits, those exhibits are online if people go to those. Exactly, that, that's the website for each of those exhibits. Online. Right. And, he, and he, Flo, Flo Grizz. And Lynn has, Lynn has one happening at the Griswold Museum in February, is that right? Right, in, in next year, February okay. 22. And I, I didn't even stop to think about online exhibits um, and you're not gonna have this in nice, you know, on a nice banner like Tara put here, but you can find last year's um, quilt exhibit that I did for the Connecticut Historical Society under their website, chs.org, under exhibits. That was a fabulous exhibit. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and let people know. Let people, <laughs> let people know that uh, Tara, is this episode available to? Um, you have to have a link to get to the episode we just did, right? Uh, you will have to after today, yes. Okay, and so if people wanted to invite other people to see this without the live Q&A, uh, how would they do that? <laughs> We're going to include the first three free episodes with the paid tickets for our events going forward. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So you'll okay. get the whole bundle. You'll get all of it. You can just binge watch all the six know it alls. <laughs> Somebody needs to start documenting what's in each one. You know, not so many we've almost forgotten. So they can add it to the quilt index. Yeah. <laughs> fun, right. fun, fun, fun. Thanks, for Thanks, Tara. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.